Hello, everybody. Welcome to Wine World TV, the best wine show anywhere. I'm your host, Mark Fusco. I've got a special edition. We're going to call it a Freestyle Friday where I get to do what I want. I'm going to be interviewing Jake Whitman, correct? Got it. All right, good, because sometimes I forget names. Um, <laughs> anyway, interviewing Jake Whitman. He's with this company, Really Good Boxed Wine. Um, and uh, I'm super excited to do this because I really want to explore the benefits uh, of boxed wine and the fact that you can get, well, really good box wine in a box wine. Um, so let's, uh, let's get into it. Jay, kind of, um, tell me what, uh, tell, how'd you get into this? Like, why would you get into this? I don't know your background. I really don't know your background. So I don't know if you came from wineries, if, if you just thought wine was really cool and you want to get into it or what? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm very excited to be here. Thanks for having me on. Um, oh, and, like uh, what, say... what's your, what's your role in the company too? <laughs> I know you're founder. Uh, yes. Uh, <laughs> yes. So I'm the fa so I'm the founder and CEO of Really okay. Good Box Wine, and um, came into this purely as a consumer. I have no professional wine background. Really love wine, um, <clears throat> but let me. I can kind of give you. I'll, I'll keep it relatively short. But uh, I I start early on my career. Started it in Teach for America. I was a high school special ed math teacher for a couple of years in Philadelphia. Um, when I left there, I started a nonprofit and ran that for a couple of years, um, supporting athletic programs in Philadelphia schools. And then um, wrote a book, started a publishing company, published a book about the Teach for America admissions process, um, really trying to help kind of equal, like level the playing field in the application process. So everyone had the same access to the same information. Ended up publishing a second company, or sorry, a second book under that company um, from a different author and was kind of in the social entrepreneurship world really early on in my life. So that was kind of my first dabbling in the entrepreneurship world, I would say. Um, but born and raised in Cincinnati, um, Procter and Gamble was always kind of, I mean, they kind of run the town in, in Cincinnati. And so I know. And so <laughs> I yeah. lived there. I lived there for four years. <laughs> oh, did you? Great. So yeah, that's, where I, that's where I'm based now. I'm in, yeah. I'm in Cincinnati, back in Cincinnati now. So um, thought, you know, maybe, maybe now's the time to learn, learn how to run a business. And instead of paying to get an MBA, let's, let's go get paid to get, get paid to get an MBA. And uh, started calling everyone I could think of and found the right person who could help me get my foot in the door and move back to Cincinnati to be in brand management at Procter & Gamble. So kind of did this big 180 in my career very early on. Spent a number of years in consumer goods, mostly Old Spice and Gillette. Super fun brands. Um, really, a really amazing experience kind of learning the full kind of scope of kind of big, big co, I would call it, big co brands. Um, decided after about five years, it was time to to learn a new industry. So I moved into tech, moved back, moved away from Cincinnati a second time and moved to, to San Francisco to go work for Intuit, um, ran the go-to-market team for the Intuit brand for a couple of years, uh, and then left there. My boss went to be the, C the CMO at SoFi, and I followed her a couple of months later as the head of product marketing for one of SoFi's products. So called a decade in the corporate world, all marketing and brand management, no direct experience in wine um but moved out to california started spending more time in wine country really grew to appreciate the, the craft of winemaking started to get to know a few handful a few people in the industry who turned out to be some of the you know the kind of the very beginnings of this of this idea um and so then the, the founder story and i'll again i'll keep this one kind of quick is about a year and a, half, a little over a year and a half ago my wife my brother and i were kind of sitting we were sitting around drinking a bottle of rosé in a park in Santa Monica. My brother lives in LA and uh, we got on the topic of box wine and my wife and I would buy a box every once in a while during COVID loved all the benefits of it, loved that we could just kind of have it sitting on the counter. It was always less expensive than the same quality um, wine, but and we loved the environmental benefit, like the, everything we liked about it, but we could never find what we liked and try different brands, different varietals, different, you know, we tried lots of different types and we're always really disappointed. So that conversation sparked me to spend about five hours digging into the industry and trying to understand. I was expecting to log on and see like 25 brands all trying to do this. And uh, kind of the way canned wine has started to explode and you have all these canned wines, they're all kind of jockeying for position over the last call it five or six years. 
And I found that really nobody was doing it. Nobody was creating like the quality of wine that we wanted, um, vintage and varietal premium regions, the kind of wine that we would typically drink in a bottle. Um, nobody was doing it. And, you know, then look, started looking at the technical details, started looking into the, you know, how do you transport it? How do you manufacture it? And all of a sudden it was like, this is something that I really want. And I started asking friends who I felt like were in the right kind of demographic and they were like, oh my gosh, that sounds great. You should go do that. So I called one of my friends who who owns a vineyard in, in the Russian River Valley, um, this beautiful 10 acres of Stanley Farm Vineyard, the Ketchum Estate is the name of their, that's the name of their, their winery. And I was like, Ali, I've, who's the owner, Ali Ketchum. And I was like, Ali, I've just spent the last like seven hours of my life looking into this. Uh, now I can't get out of my head. What do you think? And if you like it, do you want to do the first one together? And she was like, Jake, I love it. Let's do it. And that was kind of the beginning of a really good box line. Cool. Um, yeah, so that, that's awesome. Um, so you've got, uh, so you've got a line of wines. You've got four right now. Uh, you've got this one, you got the cab from Paso. Um, and you just launched or you're uh, getting ready to launch uh, another, you have a new partnership. Uh, with another, yeah, we actually right? have five now. Yeah, okay, five. Launched. Okay, cool. Um, <clears throat> this newest one gets us to five, and then six in total, in addition to the to the Pinot, the Russian River Valley Pinot that we launched and sold out last year. So six total wines. We now have five five out. Um, the most recent one, this one that we just launched, is is a new kind of wine extension. We're calling the Collaboration Series, where we do a much kind of richer and deeper collaboration with our our partner and feature them on the label and kind of tell their story together. Um, and so this has been a passion project of getting this one out the door. We're partnering with uh, uh, Smith Devereaux Winery, even Ian Devereaux, the, the founder of the um, of the winery is just like a phenomenal human being. And the second we started talking, it, it clicked and we're like, let's do something deeper than just like taking, you know, working together to kind of source your wine and put it in a box. Let's create a real collaboration around this. Okay. And, um, so with, with some of these wines, um, so the, these are definitely partnerships. Um, so they're, they're are they, they basically taking care of the majority of stuff and then you're, you're doing the packaging, um, or are you doing any type of finishing? Yeah. So it really depends actually. Um, the, our rosé and our Sauvignon Blanc, we actually bought the grapes and we crushed and fermented. Um, we are a licensed California winery. So those are made by really good box wine. Um, and we have a, a winemaker who's um, part-time with us, but she's a, she's a phenomenal winemaker in, in, in Hillsburg, um, and she made those wines. But even when we do partners, so with this cab that, we're, that you're going to try, um, the Pinot and then, the, and then the, the red blend that we just launched, those are, we work very closely with the wine, with the winemakers and the producers, and we may taste, I don't know, <laughs> anywhere from 20 to 50 wines when we're getting ready to launch a varietal. There's a lot of a lot of tasting of, of, of different wines. And then, but then we always bring it into our winery. Tammy is involved in every wine. Um, usually very minimal finishing. We don't do added, like we, it's pretty low intervention wine. We want it to kind of taste like the vineyard and we're partnering with um, boutique kind of boots on the ground producers for the most part. So we don't do a lot of finishing, but we will, you know, if we need to bring the acid down a little bit, we might do that or, or something just to kind of get it get it where we want it. And then we do cross flow filter the wine and get it bottle ready. Um, we don't want the spout, the clog. So we do some minor finishing or Tammy's always involved, but, um, but we touch everything. Yeah. Um, I mean, I like to call them adjustments. Um, you yeah. know, and things happen. Right. Hey, hey, in Texas, I don't know if you've ever had any Texas wines, but in Texas, um, acid is actually a, a problem because we don't have enough acid in our wines. Mm. So, um, typically there's some acidification to the wine and, um, Otherwise, it's just flabby. Uh, yeah. So, which is um, which you don't want that. <laughs> no. Um, so cool. Um, and then, um, so you you kind of touched upon sustainability. So it seems like you try to work with people that are doing some type of sustainability in their vineyards and wineries. And can you talk about that because that's also very crucial sure. for the whole idea of box wine, anyway. Right. Yeah. We. Whenever we possibly can, we'll partner with sustainable winemakers who either farm sustainably or are, are actually certified sustainable. Um, it's not a hundred percent a requirement for the brand. We want to find the best possible wine that we can, but it is a when you look at the list of priorities, it's on the high high priority list as we're as we're sourcing. Um, 
the cab that you have is a certified sustainable and practice vineyard, um, which is kind of it's a it's a certification that um, is really actually a higher quality. It's a higher level of requirements even than organic farming. So it takes into account labor practices and all of that. And that was a big part of um, this producer's kind of approach to to winemaking. Um, so the sustainability side on the winemaking is is very high priority. And then to your point, the, the packaging overall is um, is a major carbon footprint reduction versus versus bottles. And that's one of the, honestly, that's one of the best things about box wines in the industry, not just ours, but kind of all box wines out there. Um, and there are lots of studies showing <clears throat> the reduction in carbon footprint, you know, everything from for a sustainable winemaking alliance to you know Jancis Robinson has done some has done some reports on it. Um, New York Times has talked about it, and and there's a lot of just studies out there showing how much more sustainable this packaging is versus bottles. Yeah, um, I, I had a th- oh so yeah to talk about the sustainable SIP sustainable sustainability in practice. So you may not know, but hopefully my viewers know. So around this time, well. By the time this video comes out, around this time last year, or maybe if, like, I think closer to December when it came out, I uh, had a whole series of um, agricultural uh, shows, um, deep dives into each type of agricultural practice that we do um, and the wines that come from them. So the sustainability side of things, I really talked in, I've talked about that. And like you said, in many ways, it's a higher standard than organic because to be to be certified sustainable you're doing organic farming anyway and then you're putting in the rest of the components especially like you're talking about how you operate as a business um and how you treat your people and everything else so uh sustain so while organic is the i don't know the the catchphrase and bio is the catchphrase the buzzword, yeah, the buzzword. The buzzword. yeah the best that's what i was looking for the buzzword uh sustainability um, is, is really where it's at. And then, um, to me, the next level is regenerative, uh, organic certification. Um, but that takes agriculture to yet a different level, but I think sustainability is definitely fine, um, for what you need to do. Um, regenerative agriculture just kind of takes it to a little bit different level. And there's, I think now, four or five wineries that can now have the ROC. I just, just saw a news, yeah. a press release about it. Tablas Creek and Troon were the first two. Um, Troon was the first winery and vineyard. Tablas was the first, was I think the first vineyard. Um, okay. And I know Tablas also put out, they put out a rosé in a box wine. They charged they like did. 90 bucks for it and they sold out of like 300 boxes and they're going to yeah. do it again. So, um, yep. so it's not just, you know, I guess, uh, 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 not uh, upstarts, um, whatever, like companies like you, startups, yeah, startups, yeah. yeah. <laughs> start, startups that are, or, or newer companies, you have established wineries that are going, Hey, this is something that's legit. Um, so again, I want, that's why I really want to focus on this. So yeah, let's well, kind of talk cool, about like there isn't, there, there isn't a technical reason why you can't do it. Like it, it's, yeah. it's, uh, it's kind of producers for the last several decades have been have chosen this format to put kind of mid-tier and lower quality and lower tier wines in, but there's no technical reason why you can't. Um, it's and so I think there's with this move towards sustainability and and convenience in a lot of ways. There's there I certainly believe that there's a huge that there's room for this to carve out a big chunk of the industry. Do I think it's going to replace bottles entirely? No, and it shouldn't. No. Bottles are amazing <laughs> if you want to age wine for ten years or twenty years or whatever. That's the best format. That's what you should buy. But um, I think it provides so many benefits to the consumer and to the, to the producer, the consumer, and the planet that um, you know. I think we're going to start seeing more and more people going in, more and more producers exper- experimenting and then expanding this this format. Yeah. So I think, um, and, and uh, you probably know way better than this than I do, but I, I've heard that in Europe this is a even a more accepted format of your. Uh, of wines. And I, I, I've, I've been to Europe a few times, but I've never paid attention about box wine, at least not going to retail as far as box wine or noticing it at, at wineries. But I'm hearing that the, in Europe, they're being more accepting of, is that, is that correct? Yeah. It's much more established and more accepted yeah. in Europe for sure. And even, even if you go to like a, and I don't have this experience personally, um, I'm going to want, I want to go do it soon. But if, you, if a lot of times you can go to like a, a French vineyard or something, and they may 
and you want if you want to buy some wine if you're going to drink it that day then they send it home in a bag instead of a bottle because it yeah. doesn't make sense to put it in glass if you're going to drink it in four hours <laughs> exactly yeah so yeah i hear the stories yeah. hear the stories all the time people are like you know i used to live so so i just went to the winery and they just filled up my bottle or filled up my whatever yeah. i was like yeah that that's great like you know it's great you know <laughs> i love it i love it but like but I, I, I like can't, say, I like, can't do anything. I can't do anything for you on that. <laughs> and, and we can't do anything for you here. And, and, you know, I like Europe is just ahead of us in that. And it is a better format in a lot of ways and we're missing out. So let's, let's bring it here. Yeah. Why not? Um, so you, let's yeah, talk about the, let's talk about like really the benefits of box wine. Now, I knew you guys had sent me, um, some stuff, uh, about it. So first of all, we already kind of touched upon that once this, once it's in this format, It'll, it'll go for at least a year, um, you know, as far as fresh, but it's not like it's going to be oxidized, unlike right. the box ones I tried before, which I'm doing a review of those soon. I had to buy new boxes for that. Um, okay. But uh, I did. I bought I bought them. They, so first gotcha. of all, uh, full, full disclosure, they sent this to me. I did not pay for this. Okay, that's to stay FTC compliant. Um, yep. But um, anyway... Um, Let's talk about like this. So once you open this, once you break the seal, so how long can you kind of uh, let it go? Yeah, six, we, we say six weeks. Um, okay. And I, so open it stays fresh for up to six weeks after opening is kind of the, the, the claim. And, and we've tested it, all of our varietals over different, you know, environmental factors and stuff like that. And it, it, it definitely lives up to it. Um, I will say that we even have people who <clears throat> put it in the fridge and come back two or three months later and they're like, Jake, it's fine. It tastes great. So, but we can't, yeah. we don't claim it obviously, like, cause we don't want to falsely claim that and then have someone store, you know, open for three months and then it tastes like vinegar, which it, it could start to oxidize after that time. So right. six weeks is a very kind of clear um, length of time that, that the wine will stay fresh, typically a little longer in the fridge. Okay. Yeah. Uh, similar to, kind of, I don't know, uh, uh, Corvin has their screw cap thing mm -hmm. and they, they say yeah. it's good for up to three months. I let something go five plus months and there was not much wine left in it. Uh, uh -huh. and it, and it was also a high acid wine. It was a Gruner Velt leaner. It wasn't like anything special. It was a one liter. I forgot the name of it. Um, tasted yeah. good, but it wasn't like expensive and it was slightly less acidic. Yeah. That was it. It, and I, I, so Yes, we, we have a, was, a great option too. I yeah, love it doesn't even keep oxygen off the wine. I mean, that's 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 the beauty of it is it keeps oxygen off mm -hmm. the wine, and and that's you know that and simple solution perfect. of the bag crushing around it. Yeah, it's yeah. not perfect. It's not perfect, right? but it 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 really fulfills a good need. But yeah, so uh, same idea, like you know, up to six weeks for sure. If you push it, you push it. It'll probably be okay, but you're going to start noticing something after six weeks. It may not be as fresh. You, you might start noticing other things. And that's like with anything, any product, any consumable. Um, I mean, wine is a perishable, but not. Um, whatever the, you know, the best buy date or the ex expiration date, you know, usually if you've kept it in good conditions, it's going to be fine for a little bit after that. Mm -hmm. But at some point, yeah, it's just, it's not going to be good. It's more like right. you're guaranteeing that it's going to stay good up to this point. Um, and then um, uh, let's talk about the carbon footprint. Uh, you talked about how it's 50% uh, lower than, than mm -hmm. uh, bottled. So how is yep. how, how, so why is it that much less carbon footprint? Yeah, there's, there's a number of reasons. Um, <clears throat> so one, one of those boxes and, uh, holds four bottles of wine. It doesn't look like it when you hold it up to the camera. Right? But it holds four, <laughs> four full bottles of wine, right? And you can hold it in your hand. So that box in the in the bag inside replaces four bottles, four corks, eight labels, four foils, all the stuff that surrounds the the boxes during packaging. Um, the weight is ninety percent lower, and so all of the cost of the uh, um, all of the uh, fossil fuels needed to transport them. Not just when there's wine in the bottles, but Bottles are produced sometimes overseas and shipped empty overseas, and you have to use cardboard or styrofoam to protect them on, on ships that come from overseas. Um, and then, and then making bottles. Glad if you kind of work backwards along the supply chain uh, or the production chain, making bottles you, requires an incredible amount of heat, like 2,700 degrees Fahrenheit to to do it, which obviously takes um, takes a lot of fossil fuels as well. So you kind of add all those things together. 
and you get this incredibly high reduction in carbon footprint um, in, in, in this packaging um, first bottles. And some of the stat, like we take this claim very seriously. It's a big part of the, um, it's a big part of our brand and what, and, and why I, I so, I so personally am so passionate about this. It's a big part of that. Uh, but the California Sustainable Winemaking Alliance has put out a study that shows that over 50% of the carbon footprint comes from packaging and transportation of, of bottles. Um, the New York Times said that uh, of the 90, if we were to switch to bag and box from the 97% of wines that are drank within a year, it's the same as taking 400,000 cars off the road. So this is like a real problem in the wine industry. I think people don't really realize it um, because glass is infinitely recyclable if it's recycled in the right way. The problem is it's not, and it's heavy, and it's often in the inland, in the up in landfills anyway. And so, um, you know, the EPA I think says that less that less than a third of glass bottles are recycled, and the, and the true number is probably lower than that um, because it's not handled correctly at the facility. So, I wish that we would get to a place where glass bottles were infinitely recycled like they should. That would be a great thing for the planet, but unfortunately, it's not the reality. Yeah, exactly. So something like this is just it's just going to help out with. Um, uh, your carbon footprint. Uh, it's also, I mean, just in, in general, I mean, it's, it takes up less space. Like bottles are big and bulky compared to one box. So, I mean, just think yeah. about how many, how many bottles in this volume would, would be that way. I, I, I know you can't, well, yeah, you can kind of see it on your feed. Yeah. So, so real quick. So I have my laptop there. The camera's kind of facing up. Jake can actually see the top of the green screen uh, though. You guys just see the background. Although I probably turned on the green, turned off the background. You see the green screen, and I have my normal camera. So I look at the camera, then I look down. I look. So anyway, um, inside. I always do inside baseball for some reason. But I, I mean, the last thing at, I would say on, the, on, yeah. on that note, the last thing I say on that note is um, when we palletize our wines, we can fit. So it's half the oh, weight. Yeah. It's half the weight. So when we palletize our wines, we can fit almost twice as much wine by volume onto a pallet at basically the same weight. Yeah, because it's half the weight. So much it's so they they sit flush against each other. So that's yeah, another big you know exactly. we fit a lot more in the same truck. Yeah, so I mean, there's so many benefits to this just because it takes up you know you're you're putting more wine in a smaller volume, um, and that's just and over over, you know, we start doing economies of scale. That's not just cost benefit, just money wise. That's helping you with all the other uh, carbon footprint stuff. Um, let's see here. Uh, we'll see some other stuff. So, uh, one of the things that you talked about, uh, in it's in the stuff you sent me, it's also on your website. So uh, this sells for 65 and I know a lot of people are used to $20 or less for box wine. And, and the reality is that means you're getting a $5 bottle, the equivalent of a $5 bottle, if they were somehow able to be put into bottles without any extra cost. Um, I guess reality a $20 box would be the equivalent of maybe four, maybe not $10 bottles, but maybe like $8 bottles considering yeah, how much. Yeah, eight to 10, call it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I know I know the packaging of a bottle and I did an episode last year about it. Um, I created I created an iconic wine, which was based off of um, Diamond Creek. And then I created a, just a generic $10 wine. And I was like, how do you get $10 wine? And besides that you need um, $300 per ton fruit, um, and, uh, and I, I did deep dive. I took, I took, um, I actually went into California's agriculture report, got the price per ton averages of all the sectors. And I know way more than I need to know. Um, and I probably already forgotten half of it, but you know, a bottle can cost around a dollar. I mean, it can cost more. You can get three and four and $5 bottles and corks and, and the foil and all this stuff. They all add up. And then for that $10 bottle, you know, a good, sometimes upwards of 20% of the cost of the bottle is just the package. It's just the bottle um, plus all the other stuff. And it could be even higher, but so it's 65 bucks. And so uh, I don't know what that is divided by four. I should have done that. It's like a 1650, uh, 15, That's 1650 right? 1650. I've done that calculation many times. It's on your website too. I know it's on your website. Oh, okay. I remember seeing that. Yeah. Um, but um, you're talking about how, because of the cost factor, the cost savings, this would be the equivalent of say, 20, anywhere between 30 and $40 per bottle yeah. uh, if, you, if you actually bottled it, right? Yeah, it's the quali that's the quality that we're kind of striving for, somewhere in that 30 to 40. And, you know, price is a 
price is a relatively arbitrary thing in wine, right? It is yes. <laughs> it is one of the better in ways that we can indicate quality, but it certainly isn't the only way. So what right. we what we like to what we like to say is, you know, all of our wines are vintage, they're all varietal, they're all coming from premium uh Apple ABAs or, or premium regions. And we we strive to find that call it twenty five if you widen the range twenty five to forty five dollar quality of what it would show up on the shelf, knowing that price isn't the only isn't the only thing. But that that's kind of the if you think about that thirty to forty dollar bottle of wine that you love, that's that's what that's how we want you to think about this wine when you try it. Yeah. Uh yep. price price is somewhat in some ways is very objective because there's absolute mm -hmm. costs and then there you need you need to you need to get a profit out of it. I mean we're we're not here right. making wine just because we feel like making wine or any product. Um, but uh, at the same time, there are other intangibles, I would say, mm -hmm. that contribute to the final price of whatever a wine is, you know. So if if this became like the gold standard of box wines, well, you could charge more, you know, versus mm -hmm. if I just decided I want to make a box wine. Well, I can't I wouldn't be able to charge even if it was the same quality juice inside. I wouldn't have the reputation and the experience and the uh, the trust of of the consumer uh, and whatever else. I mean that that's part of it. It's just like you, you talk about being a brand manager, right? You know, yeah. branding. Branding is everything. You know, building trust. That's right. Yeah, it's building trust. There's brand loyalty. <laughs> um, you know, there's a reason why Diamond Creek is two hundred and fifty dollars a bottle versus if I took somehow their same grapes and made it myself, I couldn't charge two fifty for it. Um, right. You know, just I I, I just can't. Uh, no one right. knows who I am <laughs> and they've, they've taken decades to, to build that reputation because they, there's a trust that when you sure. buy, we buy their wine, it's going to be good every time. Um, and that's what we want to build, right? Like we'd say, you know, one of the beauties is it's kind of a blank, like a, it's kind of a blank canvas. Our, our brand is because our promise is that the wine is going to be really good and it's going to come in a box. That's the name of the brand. That's what it yeah. is. But we are vintage we are varietal agnostic we are region agnostic um it kind of gives us the whole globe to look for potential partners to, to source from or potential grapes to, to purchase and, and make wine with which um it's just a really fun exercise because we can you know we, we can create that trust and our vision is to create that trust for every time you get a box a really good box wine it gives you that oh wow moment the second you pour it into your glass of like i i couldn't i can't believe that that's another wine that came out of the box um and so building that trust is a big part of what we're working on building right now exactly um i, I there's there's other there's other um companies out there that are doing something similar um uh, so this this part of the industry and I'm not going to go too deep into this, um, but this part of the industry, I mean, there's a, the, the, the bottles, boxes, whatever, um, is something that is probably, it's not uncommon. It's not super common, but like in my, in my professional life over the years, we have these wines that, you know, somebody's partnered with um, and the wine's excellent and we're able to get it for um, a better price than say if the actual winery who made it put it out. Um, and I won't go into the, yeah. into the details as to why, but this is not an uncommon thing and nobody should look at those wines with any less, that they're any less quality. Um, because we have good quality wine that's, that's made in those ways. The reason I'm trying to be very, uh, careful how I say it, because in our industry, we call it bulk wine and it's not bulk <laughs> or bulk juice. We call it bulk juice right. and it's not bulk because bulk means it's Bulk to most people means it's cheap. Um, this is like, there's reasons, many, many, many reasons why um, this happens. Um, like I said, I won't go too deep about it, but you absolutely can get some great stuff. And um, so nobody should ever look at that it's and go, still well, made. it's still made. Yeah, it's Someone. still made by wonderful <laughs> winemakers. Yeah, and absolutely. Who are, who are making, you know, some of our wines, when they sell retail, they may sell all a very similar wine for $50 a bottle. I mean, they're wonderful winemakers. We take, we Absolutely. form direct relationships with all of them. We're very careful in not buying that cheaper bulk wine. We don't go through big broker houses. We don't go through big corporations. We're partnering directly yeah. with producers and it just, we're, we're, we're making minor adjustments to your point, adjusting the wine a little bit just to kind of fit the, the format and, and, and then putting it out under, under this brand. But it's, it's pretty common in the wine industry to, yeah. To, to make wine this way. 
There's a big difference between this and um, other well-established boxed wines that have been around for 30, 40, 50 years. Um, you know, your, your, yes. your hearty burgundies, so, so to speak. Yes. Well, let's, you know, we talked about the wine a lot, so let's, let's get into this and we can talk more. So, um, so you got a little, I know you can't see it on camera, but it says open here. So we got that. And then I'll fish for the, uh, little spigot here. Now I will say with box wine, this is always the fun part is getting the spigot. Finding the spigot. <laughs> yeah. And the little, little flap up here helps too. Here we go. I haven't seen yours yet, but they all seem to be, most spigots seem to be about the same type of design. Yeah, yours is what I'm used to. So I don't know if I can, I'm going to hold it up. Hopefully I'll zoom in a little bit. There's a little tab here. You're going to pull that tab. Actually, was it this one? Yeah. You know, yeah, you where is it? Pull that oh, no, sorry. Tab off this there. tab here. Don't do this. I, I That produces the wine. This little <laughs> tab here, you're going to pull it up and you're going to pull it around and that basically unlocks the spigot. And then you're going to just pour the wine and then that's it. You did a great job on that. Sometimes the first, <laughs> I know you've opened these before. Sometimes it takes I have. a little bit of time to figure out how to, how to open them. Um, we have a little video of me doing it on the bottom of the key. If anyone, if anyone wants to watch me awkwardly open a box of wine. <laughs> so you don't do the Molly Duker shake on this though. Do you, do you know what that is? The Molly Duker shake. So Molly Duker, Aust Australia, this is legit. Australian wine make, Australian winery. Uh, they, everything's screw cap. Even their like $200 premium Shiraz is, is screw cap. And what they do is they add nitrogen to it as an antioxidant. And what you do is you open it, um, you pour a touch out, um, and then you put the screw cap back on, and then you literally shake it because it oxidizes the wine. Because um, it's been under such a reductive environment that no oxygen really has been getting in there. Um, that you can, It's not that you get the, not that you get the, the sulfurous thing, because um, usually when we say reductive, you get that rotten egg, or match, you know, match stick type of thing. Um, the nitrogen is helping to prevent that. But yeah, you literally do it. So, and they have a video that actually says, we, we really suggest you do this. Uh, I just poured it and I uh, talked about, we do, uh, I'll do stats. So let me do those real quick. Uh, so this is the 2019, uh, really good box wine, Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, it is 98% uh, from Paso Robles. Now, um, the, the text sheet said uh, from the San Juan Creek, uh, sub Appalachian. I really don't know where that is. I feel bad because uh, I know where all the Napa Valley sub apps are, but I can't picture where this is. And I'll put a map up so that way you guys can see where it is. Um, plus, I need to know this at some point. Um, and then uh, it's 98% Cabernet Sauvignon, 2% Malbec, uh, and Mer sorry, Malbec and Merlot. Um, and then we've got uh, 18 months in oak, 25% is new French and American. Uh, the ABV is 14.5%. The residual sugar, 0.1%. Uh, so that's less than one, one gram per liter, right? Um, and then total city, five grams per liter. pH is 3.96. The bricks at harvest is 24.5. I'd love having all these little stats. Um, I know for most people, it doesn't really mean things, but to somebody like me, it allows me to get a little more insight into the winemaking and what's going on. Um, so yeah, and uh, I'll tell you all the numbers match, all the numbers look right. Um, so um, we're looking at that. So uh, uh, let's see, I have a couple other notes and I can start doing this. So I think you, I think we've covered most of this, most of the stuff here from the, from the notes you guys sent me or whatever I saw on the website. So let's just get into the wine. I don't really need the, I don't need really my white background. I mean, as far as I can tell, you know, color looks great. Um, you know, you got a, you got a deep red color here, more probably more like ruby. I used to have a white piece of paper here, but I don't have it in front of me. I think I threw it out. Oh, here it is. Or here's a yeah, here it is. Um, I also poured a little bit more wine than I normally pour, but yeah, I mean, you've got a really deep concentration of red on here. Um, I would call it moderate staining on the glass. I, I go through kind of like the grid uh, on the, for the court. Um, and then we'll, we'll say that, um, uh, the tiers are, 
They're definitely on a medium plus, which matches what the alcohol is. 14.5, we're in a medium plus alcohol range. We're actually closer to high. Um, I would usually consider 14.5 high. Um, so the tiers match that. Um, they don't always, they don't have to, um, but that's just an indication of things. Let's just get into the nose. I mean, it's clean and sound. So, so full, I'm going to say full disclosure, but I've had this box since February, I think. Yeah, March. I think we shipped it to you in February or March. Yeah, and yeah, this is six months. this is September 22nd. Um, so, I mean, I've had it for about seven months. It's Thursday, the 22nd of September, 2022. <laughs> Thanks, Captain Obvious. Um, confirmed. <laughs> confirmed, see? At 9.29 Central Time. Um, the other wine, they sent it to me in December or January. Um, and I waited till July when I recorded a bunch of other reviews and it, they were both just purely oxidized. Like I went through my whole intro and then I opened the wine and the first wine was bad. I was like, well, maybe the second wine was better because it was red and it wasn't. So like I said, I, you'll see that. I don't know if it's the, the next Friday after this one. And I don't know exactly which Friday this is going to come out. Um, but it'll either be the Friday after this one or a couple Fridays later. But I repurchased those wines and I got them three weeks ago. So there should be no oxidation problem. But I will say they're non-vintage. Anyway, um, so that always concerns me. But on the nose, um, you know, I've got some really nice dark fruit on this. Uh, I would probably call it more like a, a blackberry and a raspberry, I mean, like a black raspberry. Uh, but more darker fruit, black than red. Um, you're getting a little bit of cinnamon, so your oak aging is coming through. Um, you get a touch of vanilla in there. Um, you got a little touch of baking sprite, spice, not spice. I don't know what that is. A touch of earth on here. A little fresh turned soil. A little bit of um, like a fresher forest floor, not like that musty, musty forest floor that you can maybe get more in a European wine, but it's everything's more fresh in nature, which. You know, if I was doing this as a blind, I'd be like, yeah, this is New World. In my head, I'll be, this has got to be New World, um, at least on the nose. Got a little cocoa, a little bit of, um, um, I'd say more mocha, not straight up coffee. Yeah, I mean, it smells really great. I mean, it smells high quality. So let's just get on the palate. It tastes great. I mean, I see where you're coming that this is probably going to be in the equivalent of that 30 to $40 range for a bottle of wine. I've had plenty of Paso wine. I've had Napa wine. What I love about Paso is it, it's not a pure um, uh, relation or ratio, but a lot of times I'll have a Paso wine and I've, I've had times where I thought it was Napa. And then I find that it's Paso and I'm like, okay, so it's a Paso wine for 20 or 30 bucks and I've had the equivalent quality from Napa and it's usually 40 or 60. It's not quite always at two times, but because Napa is just that much more expensive to make wine, the, the, the grapes, the land is way more expensive. The, so the price per ton is way more expensive. And then their, their, their operating costs are just more expensive. I mean, they, they tend to have fancier wineries and all that kind of stuff. Um, they charge yeah, more for the wine. Into the, yeah, they have yeah. to charge more. There's a they lot more cost. Yeah. You know, their winemakers are usually getting paid more. You know, everything associated with running a business, there's a reason why wines cost way they cost or just any product, honestly. But yeah. You know, we, as you're, as you're kind of finishing up, you know, we, we, I think we talked about this a little bit, but we really pride ourselves on making wine that is true to the region and true to the, true to the, to the varietal, true to the region. So, you know, this one's maybe the, what what you are seeing is is fresh. It actually that like warms my heart because it this is a little bit of a riper style, I think, than maybe some of the really oh, yeah. big panic Napa Napa cabs, and that's very intentional. That's kind of the passive style. Yeah, and I I see that as the passive style. It's juicy. Um, it's very fruit forward. Um, some I wouldn't call it sweet because it's not because obviously it's not. So there's you know, I I know there's a difference between sweet and then just fruity. Um, because I mean, the sugar is not a lot. And I would never say that someone calls, would call this a sweet wine, but it's juicy, it's fruity, it's ripe. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's not- Flavorful, yeah, it's flavor, ripe and flavorful. Uh, ripe and flavorful. It's not jammy, um, but it's, it's definitely on that ripe side. You know, 24 and a half bricks, that's not pushing the limit, but you're, you're getting into a nice ripe amount. Um, that's why 
the 14 and a half alcohols there. Um, I do feel the alcohol, but it's well integrated. Like, like if I was blind tasting this, I'd be like, this is probably high. Um, I probably would say this is probably right about 14.5. And I'm not perfect with alcohol. Nobody can be. Um, but I tend to be really close within a half of a percent of alcohol. I don't know why. I just focus on it. I don't know why. But I just tend to be fairly accurate. But there's been times I'm like, oh, this is high alcohol. And it's like 13. I'm like, oh, okay. Um, I totally, totally messed it up. But yeah, it's it's got that juicy flavor to it. It's ripe. Um, it's delicious. Uh, the oak is coming through, but it's not like over the top. I mean, the 25% new is really nice. It adds more complexity to it. Um, you're getting that, <clears throat> you're getting that cinnamon, you're getting that baking spice, you're getting that vanilla, uh, even a little bit of caramelization or caramel. That mocha is not over the top, um, but it's there, it's present. It's more of a chocolate side, side of thing rather than purely coffee. There's a little bit of um, rusticity to it, um, like a bramble type of thing. Like, like, um, it's kind of hard to describe that type of thing, but when I, when I get that earth, it's really earthiness, right? <clears throat> but it's, there's a dryness. So in some ways this finishes a little bit like a European wine. It starts off, sometimes they start off in that sweet attack on the fruit and then the, and then they finish on a drier side. It's not that the fruit finishes drier, but the, the second and tertiary becomes more evident as the fruit kind of fades. Um, then you get um, other things that are coming into the forefront, like your earthiness, and you get that bramble and that, that type of stuff, the forest floor. Again, it's not super dried out, but yeah, I mean, I think, I think it's worth it. And I know that I think our, our consumer still feels box wine is $20. And when they go 65, they kind of go, wow, but you know, there's four bottles of wine in there. <laughs> like yeah. you're still paying less than 20 bucks a bottle. Like, yeah. you know, you're getting excellent stuff, you know, and I, I've been seeing it where I, in, in, in my, the other side of my life, um, I'm seeing some stuff at the retail level, get into the 25 up to $30 range on boxes. But, um, you know, I, I think it's, it's going to be harder for a little bit to get to that. But I mean, this this wine is excellent. Like I'm looking forward. Thank you. Like I really am. I'm really upset that I have to work today because um, I can't. <laughs> I have to. I have to dump the rest of that wine. But well, here's hey, the I, good news: the rest yeah. of that box will stay fresh for the next six weeks, so you don't have to worry about. <laughs> I don't. At all today. I don't at all. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, this is one of those things where, you know, um, so to be purely honest, like uh, the person who even reached out to me is somebody that I know in a Facebook group. Uh, so Amy, right. And yeah. you know, she was like, it's really good. I'm like, okay, you can send it. And it's not that I don't trust people, but you know, and, and it's, and I, I think box wine is great, but you know, there's mm -hmm. all different qualities. So I'm like, okay, I, 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 you know, I checked out the website, say, I like what the website does. I, I doesn't make any outrageous claims about certain things like some other companies do. I said, I'll, mm -hmm. I'll give it a fair shot, you know? And, uh, I also kind of walked into this with, um, a more positive, um, impression, um, just because of, uh, there's again, a trust factor, right? So I don't know Amy like super well, but I know her enough that I feel I can trust her. So, sure. um, so again, there's a, there's a trust factor there where, whereas other things I might go, you know, I don't know. I, I see what you do. Uh, it might be really great stuff inside, but there's other things that kind of, I'm not really a fan of, but we'll give it a shot. And sometimes I'm totally impressed. And sometimes my, yeah. my, prejudging um turns out to be true so um yeah in this case i mean it, it is it is really, true yeah. you know and, and this this is not you know this is talking about us not anyone else but we we are very um cautious of not using language that we don't feel like is transparent and honest and it's a big part of our brand is being honest and truthful and transparent about about how we make the wines what the claims are of the wines and, and what and what we're building and um, you mentioned Amy. Amy start, has been consulting with us for the last almost, well, almost a year now. She started October of last year, right in the early, very early days of the brand, and uh, is now come on as COO of the company as of about a month and a half ago. Um, and it was her, I mean, she, she was our behind the scenes, like, secret weapon, and now is, like, forefront weapon, <laughs> Yeah, I would say. And she, she's 20, you know, she's a 
25 years in the wine industry has has um, worked in every corner of it from distribution and sourcing to sourcing distribution, front of house, buying. She's kind of been everywhere. She's a sommelier um, and is just an integral part of the brand at this point. And so I feel very lucky to have her formally involved, but she, you know, she helps craft what we're building right now from, from the very early days of the brand. And that from, from day one, her and I have talked about truth, being truthful and honest and transparent and just making really great wine. Let's just put really great wine in this format. Yeah. The format's awesome and you can do it. Absolutely. Um, you know, speaking of sommeliers, um, besides that I'm one too, um, I, I, in, in, I'm pretty sure, didn't your website say something you have a master sommelier involved with this too? Yeah, Andy Myers, um, who's, who's right, Master Andy Sommelier, yeah. has has endorsed the brand, um, and you know she, uh, Amy, Amy is Amy introduced me and Andy, and this the second Andy and I talked, it was like it was it just clicked. Like he's, I don't know, some of you may know who who Andy is um, on this on this page, but he's covered in tattoos. He plays in the metal, like he listens to metal. He listens to all kinds of music. He has an incredible music taste, but he listens to death metal. Like he's not the prototypical kind of, you know, he, he even says this. He's like, I'm not the snooty master sommelier. I am the one that like, just get great wine out to the world and just total passion, incredible palate. So yeah, um, he, he's part of the, he's part of the team. He tastes, he tastes the wines as well. Um, He's in Hawaii now, so it's a little bit harder to get him to <laughs> to get him wine <laughs> and to get him actively as actively involved. But he's living the dream in Hawaii right now. Um, but just you know, we talked and he was like, "Love what you're building. Love the sustainability side. Love democratizing access to great wine. Send me a box. Obviously, it needs to be good, or I can't put my name on it." And as soon as he tried it, he's like, "I'm in." He called me the second he and his wife tried it, and they're like, "I'm in. This is great." So yeah. we're, we're very lucky to have them involved. So take it from someone who's in the industry. When you have other industry people who have no other reason than just to say, yeah, it's good. Like they're like for someone to come to me and be like, yeah, it's really good stuff. We'd like for you to try it. There isn't necessarily a direct financial gain. It's not like, you know, my endorsement's going to necessarily, I'm not Robert Parker. Let's put it that way. You know, and I don't give scores on wines anyway, but even if I give recommendations, my recommendations are like my brand. Like I, I, to a certain group of people, my recommendations mean something to the rest of the world. Maybe not because they're like, who's that Mark guy? I don't know. Um, but you know, when I, when I deal with, when I deal with, um, industry people that I have a trust with and, and trust me, the group we're in, we are brutal about wine and about a lot of other things, but we're brutal in this group and there's like 3000 or 4,000 of us in this group. And the vast majority of us are industry people from all walks of life. And we, we are, yeah, we're brutal about certain, certain wines and brands and marketing and other types of things. So when I know somebody from that group is like, no, man, this stuff is good. I'm like, okay, I'll give it a shot. You know? So there's, there's a, there's a trust well, level. I appreciate you giving us a shot. Yeah. I appreciate you yeah. giving us a shot. This is, yeah, there's, there's, yeah, there's a certain level of trust with that. Just like when I go visit and I do my trips, um, sometimes I do everything on my own, but I try to research as much as I can so that um, I uh, know about what I'm going to get into. I'm just not randomly like walking into a situation where maybe the wine isn't that good and I have to like make nice on camera. Um, in this case, the wine is really good. Like it, it this, 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 this is, yes. Um, and I've really never had an interview where the wine was bad. I've had wines where I'm like, it's not my style. Um, and I, I've said that. But um, uh, yeah, when 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 I, that happens, I do these travels. Uh, sometimes I have my reps or other industry people set me up with the wineries. Um, and usually I know who the winery is anyway. But sometimes I don't really know them that well. But I have a, there's a, again, a trust factor. Like I'm going to walk in. They're going to have good stuff. It's going to be excellent quality. And I'm not going to be in an awkward situation where I have to somehow make something positive after, after something that's really not that positive. And when I do these interviews, sometimes uh, that, does, you know, there's always that kind of, okay, I hope it's good. Um, I had, I did an interview a, a year ago and I didn't know exactly how the wine was going to be just knowing the background of the winemaker and the impression I had. But when I did more research, I realized I wasn't going to get, what that person used to make. I'm going to get what they make now. 
which is closer to what I like. And I liked it. So that was really cool. Um, so yeah, um, I would say that, you know, if you're in the market for um, a wine that's going to be higher quality, that's in a box, um, then yeah, I, if you, you know, first of all, the link will be in the description. So definitely check them out. Uh, you talked about like you were experimenting with some um, uh, uh, distribution though, right? Uh, well, off camera, we talked about it. Yeah. Yeah, we're 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 just in the early stages of rolling out wholesale. So we're um, we're working with a great distributor in Ohio and Kentucky right now. I'm I'm in Cincinnati, Ohio, which is not the heart of the wine making world, but that actually has a really interesting, fascinating wine history that we could talk about another time. Yeah. But uh, yeah, um, but we're ro but we're rolling out here, and then also in Washington D.C. Um, <clears throat> we have a we're we're currently in Calvert Woodley in Washington D.C. and um, we, we started there the Friday before Labor Day and we did a tasting there. She's there and it has continued to just kind of exceed our expectations. So if you're in the D.C. area and want to pop in, we are in a, on an end cap at, uh, at Calvert Woodley right now. But, it, you know, this is a to your point, like sixty five, seventy dollars for a box of wine compared to the twenty to twenty five dollars on the shelf in retail. Um it is quite the jump, but mm -hmm. our vision is to change people's perception to think about this like a bottle. And that's why we put the vintage varietal and region on there. That's why we talk about, you know, the the actual winemaking and we give the technical details that you read out, which probably other box wines certainly don't have that level of detail, I would expect. Um, and we want to change that perception. And um, I think that there's really room for it in retail for wine for bars and restaurants there's no waste it's a great for for like a glass a glass four um yes it's great for so they're you know anywhere and then the other thing i'd say is anywhere where glass is either kind of a pain or maybe not allowed it's fantastic so you know days in the park by the pool little kids running around at the beach camping fishing what on boats where glass bounces around i mean there's a lot of use cases for this that I think even in a spur of the moment, you're going out camping, you're like, shoot, I want to get some good wine. You can grab it and not have to worry about, worry about bottles. Um, so it's been really, it's been really fun. It's been fun seeing how people, we got it. We had someone who took a, a five day kayaking trip down the Colorado river who was sending me pictures from it. He, he was just like, the whole group loves it. Everyone's so excited that we can drink great wine on this trip. We've been doing it for decades with our friends and uh, it just, hearing the stories of how people are using this mm -hmm. um, is, is really fun. Yeah. Uh, I, I just say that there's, there's way, way more upsides than really any downsides with, with this product. Again, you know, most, most wine, most wines consumed like within four hours of purchase. I don't know if that's still true, but it, I know I've, I heard a study several years ago about yeah. that. So you, you buy a wine today, you're probably drinking it today or you're at least drinking it within a week. Um, people like me don't necessarily do that. You know, sometimes it takes months years for me to, to, to drink a wine after I purchase it, not for any other reason than I just, I just have so much wine at home anyway, that I just kind of like, what do I feel like? So I'm, I'm constantly buying stuff or I am, I'm like, since I work in a situation where I can just literally buy wine and come home, um, that does happen. I'm like, Oh, what what's my $15 bottle that I'm going to take home? Cause I feel like having wine tonight and I don't want to pull the 40 or $50 bottle type of thing. Right. Uh, and not that I have a ton of 40 and 50 bottles, really anymore but you know that's the idea is you know your daily drinker and usually that's an under 20 right. for most people sometimes under 15 um mm -hmm. so yeah um i'm the same way like i feel like having wine tonight when i get out of work well what do i work i work in a place that sells wine perfect i yeah. i can do that so yeah um so the upsides are are phenomenal here um i i would uh, i would say that you know it's just a perception thing um it's the same thing with screw cap perception um, some of the best, some, some outstanding wines are made with screw cap. Like I mentioned Molly Duker, you know, you have $200 bottle of wine with screw cap. Um, I've never had it yeah. personally, but I've had other Molly Duker wines. So I know the quality is there. Um, but I think it's just a perception thing. And if we get more people to, to show that there's actually quality going on in this, then I think, you know, you'll, you'll get more traction on it. Um, it's still going to take time though, but yeah. Um, yeah. We're a big fan of all the other box wine producers. I we're have either direct connections with a lot of them or indirect connections with a lot of them overseas in the United States. Um, huge fan of everybody. I feel like it's a it's a movement that we can all get behind. That's that's um, to your point. The more producers that are doing it, the better. So we're 
I don't think of them. I don't think of those other producers as competition at all. I think of them as we're all trying to kind of change the perception of this format and, and make it a much more accepting, a much more accepted format um, than it is today. Cool. Um, so uh, I think we've probably covered everything that needs to be covered. Is there anything that maybe we didn't talk about that you want to talk about or? Uh... Uh, the only thing I'd say is if, you know, if people are interested, the, the easiest way to, uh, the easiest way to buy it is, is on our website, really good box wine.com. We all, also have a subscription service that right, uh, you yes. can either buy one off or as a subscription, uh, the subscription gets you some benefits. It's free shipping on all your wines and 10% off every, every box of wine. You also get first access to all of our new releases. And we're in the process of building some other fun new features like limited edition releases that are really only available to subscribers. Um, we're putting together a wine concierge service where you can get more kind of direct one-to-one um, advice on pairings and tasting notes and stuff like that. So, um, cool. you know, as we build, we're still young, right? You call us a startup. And we started this brand just over a year ago, um, was the first pilot launch and we launched nationwide in late January. So we're young, we're learning, we're, you know, if, if anyone has thoughts for us and wants to, just wants to chat or has ideas, like we're sponges right now, we're taking, we're taking ideas. We're trying to make this the best experience possible for people. So we would love to talk to anyone who's interested in, in chatting about it. Cool. All right. Um, I think, uh, I think it's a good time to wrap things up. Um, so yeah, uh, you know, Jake, I really appreciate you, you taking the time out of your day, um, to, uh, to chat up with me. Uh, I've been looking forward to doing this for well, quite a few months, honestly. Yeah. I apologize for how long it's taken me to do this. Um, I've no had, worries. I'm just, I've I'm had, excited you know, to be on. Yeah, yeah. I've had my other, just had other things outside of here and just get trying to coordinate everything. Um, but this cheers to you guys. This, this, this cheers. wine is, is excellent. I'm really impressed. Uh, folks, um, definitely check it out. Um, I know 65 bucks, but you're getting four bottles of wine. So where are you going to get four bottles of wine for $65 at the quality that you're getting here? Um, you're just not unless you own the winery <laughs> and then that costs you millions of dollars. But, uh, anyway, um, it's a lot so more than $65 for that. Yeah, a lot more than 65 bucks. <laughs> How do you make a lot of money in the wine industry? You start with even more money. Um, That's and I'm right. sure there's other industries that can say the same thing. Um, but, uh, definitely check out, I'll have a link below in the description. Uh, you know, check out what they've got going on. Um, as always, uh, you know, uh, I always script this part out and I don't have my script going because um, there's no because I control it with my laptop and I don't want to be trying to reach over it. Um, how do I end this? Oh, well, you know, that's going to do it. It's going to do it for today's show. Um, as always, you know, click like, subscribe. Every click, like, and subscription really helps build the channel even better. Tell all your friends about the best wine show anywhere. Cheers. <laughs>